Hello, my name's Evan. I'm the Queen's field lead um, for the Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez campaign. And I'm gonna start us off. We're gonna be going in a deep dive onto the US Congress and learn about the process of legislation. Then we're gonna get into Representative Ocasio-Cortez's narrative platform and accomplishments. And after all of that, we're gonna discuss how you can influence your elected officials and how you can be informed, engaged, and represented. So let's talk about Congress. We're gonna be talking about the separation of powers, bills and resolutions, committees, and floor actions. So we're gonna start talking about the separation of powers. I'm gonna let Belinda Stutzman from TED-Ed talk to you about the separation of powers. Have you ever wondered who has the authority to make laws or punish people who break them? When we think of power in the United States, we usually think of the president, but he does not act alone. In fact, he is only one piece of the power puzzle and for very good reason. When the American Revolution ended in 1783, the United States government was in a state of change. The founding fathers knew that they did not want to establish another country that was ruled by a king. So the discussions were centered on having a strong and fair national government that protected individual freedoms and did not abuse its power. When the new constitution was adopted in 1787, the structure of the infant government of the United States called for three separate branches, each with their own powers, and a system of checks and balances. This would ensure that no one branch would ever become too powerful because the other branches would always be able to check the power of the other two. These branches worked together to run the country and set guidelines for us all to live by. The legislative branch is described in Article I of the U.S. Constitution. Many people feel that the founding fathers put this branch in the document first because they thought it was the most important. The legislative branch is comprised of 100 U.S. Senators and 435 members in the U.S. House of Representatives. This is better known as a U.S. Congress. Making laws is a primary function of the legislative branch, but it is also responsible for approving federal judges and justices, passing the national budget, and declaring war. Each state gets two senators and some number of representatives, depending on how many people live in that state. The executive branch is described in Article II of the Constitution. The leaders of this branch of government are the president and vice president, who are responsible for enforcing the laws that Congress sets forth. The president works closely with a group of advisors known as the cabinet. These appointed helpers assist the president in making important decisions within their area of expertise, such as defense, the treasury, and homeland security. The executive branch also appoints government officials, commands the armed forces, and meets with leaders of other nations. All that combined is a lot of work for a lot of people. In fact, the executive branch employs over 4 million people to get everything done. The third branch of the U.S. government is the judicial branch and is detailed in Article 3. This branch is comprised of all the courts in the land, from the federal district courts to the U.S. Supreme Court. These courts interpret our nation's laws and punish those who break them. The highest court, the Supreme Court, settles disputes among states, hears appeals from state and federal courts, and determines if federal laws are constitutional. There are nine justices on the Supreme Court, and unlike any other job in our government, Supreme Court justices are appointed for life, or for as long as they want to stay. Our democracy depends on an informed citizenry, so it is our duty to know how it works and what authority each branch of government has over its citizens. Besides voting, chances are that sometime in your life, you will be called upon to participate in your government, whether it is to serve on a jury, testify in court, or petition your congressperson to pass or defeat an idea for a law. By knowing the branches, who runs them, and how they work together, you can be involved, informed, and intelligent. Thank you so much, Belinda. All right. So now let's talk about how the legislative branch separates its own powers. Congress is separated into two chambers, the House of Representatives and the Senate. The word Congress generally refers to both chambers together, but it can also be used to refer to only the House of Representatives. Members of the House are called uh, representatives or Congress people, 
and members of the Senate are called senators. So let's dive a little deeper now into the House of Representatives. We see that there are 435 members, one for each state and the rest are doled out based off of census population. Each member serves two year terms with no limits on the number of terms served in a lifetime. And members must be an American citizen for at least seven years and be at least 25 years old. Leadership in the House starts with the Speaker, and that's currently Democrat Nancy Pelosi. They're the presiding officer, and they lead the majority party in their legislative agenda. They administer House floor proceedings, oversee non-legislative business, and they generally don't vote, debate, or sit on committees. The Speaker is really important because they decide what legislation is going to be talked about each day. They refer legislation out to committees and they play a really large role in government being the second in succession to the president right after the vice president, just to give you an idea of their level of importance. Next comes the minority leader, and that's currently Republican Kevin McCarthy. And they serve as the minority party spokesman, and they direct their party's legislative strategies and operations. Then come the whips. There are two in the house, one for each party, who assist their respective party leaders. They mainly generate support from members on issues, record members' votes, and act as a speak between uh, party leaders and their members. Then in the Senate, there are 100 members, two for each state, regardless of their population. Each member serves a six-year term um, and no, with no limits on the number of terms served in a lifetime. Terms are separated into classes, class one, two, and three, and the elections are staggered based off of those classes. Members must be an American citizen for at least nine years and be at least 30 years old. Leadership in the Senate starts with the majority leader, and that's currently Democrat Chuck Schumer. And they have the right to first recognition. This means that they have the very first opportunity to offer any amendments, substitutes, and motions to reconsider before the minority leader or any other senator. They work with committee chairs and ranking members to schedule business on the floor and advise their members on legislative activity. Then comes the minority leader, and that's currently Republican Mitch McConnell. And together, both party leaders develop unanimous consent agreements, and we're going to discuss that a little bit later. They also keep legislation moving in the Senate, they open and close the floor proceedings, and they serve as their respective party spokesperson. Just like in the House, the Senate also has two whips, and they do also conduct the same activities. Both chambers are able to initiate amendments, override pres presidential vetoes, create budget resolutions, declare war, establish rules about immigration and naturalization, as well as regulating currency. So that's a lot, even for a group of 535 people. So what are some interesting facts about the House? There's only 28 members of the House that were not born in the United States. 17 members do not have a four-year degree, and this includes Representatives Cori Bush, Ayanna Presley, and Richie Torres. And that just kind of goes to show you that you don't really need an Ivy League education in order to enter the world of politics anymore. And interestingly, there's only nine publicly out LGBTQIA plus members of the House. Some interesting facts about the Senate. There are only 24 members of the Senate, despite females still making up over 50% of the general population in the United States. There have only ever been 11 African-American senators in all history. There are only three serving today. And there's a staggering only two publicly out members of the Senate. In the House right now, there are 118 women. Most of them are Democrats. And we can also see the age demographics of the House and Senate here. This is the House on the left and the Senate's on the right. We're not going to see any 20-year-olds in the Senate because they do have to be 30 years old in order to serve. 
However, um, regardless, we can tell that the majority of members here are in their 50s and 60s. Uh, does this paint an accurate picture of the United States? Uh, do you feel like communities are being represented appropriately? Let us know. Bills and resolutions. So let's talk legislation. So I'm going to get let my good friend Bill here from Schoolhouse Rock take it away. Woo, you sure got to climb a lot of steps to get to this Capitol building here in Washington. Well, I wonder who that sad little scrap of paper is. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Well, it's a long, long journey to the capital city. It's a long, long wait while I'm sitting in committee. But I know I'll be a law someday. At least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. Gee, Bill, you certainly have a lot of patience and courage. Well, I got this far. When I started, I wasn't even a bill. I was just an idea. Some folks back home decided they wanted a law passed, so they called their local congressman, and he said, you're right, there ought to be a law. And he sat down and wrote me out and introduced me to Congress, and I became a bill. And I'll remain a bill until they decide to make me a law. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I got as far as Capitol Hill. Well, now I'm stuck in committee, and I'll sit here and wait while a few key congressmen discuss and debate whether they should let me be a law. Oh, I hope and pray that they will, but today I am still just a bill. Listen to those congressmen arguing. Is all that discussion and debate about you? Yeah, I'm one of the lucky ones. Most bills never even get this far. I hope they decide to report on me favorably, otherwise I may die. Die? Yeah, die in committee. Oh, but it looks like I'm going to live. Now I go to the House of Representatives and they vote on me. If they vote, yes, what happens? Then I go to the Senate and the whole thing starts all over again. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And if they vote for me on Capitol Hill, well, then I'm off to the White House where I'll wait in a line with a lot of other bills for the president to sign. And if he signs me, then I'll be alone. How I hope and pray that he will. But today I am still just a bill. You mean even if the whole Congress says you should be allowed, the president can still say no? Yes, that's called a veto. If the president vetoes me, I have to go back to Congress and they vote on me again, and by that time, you're so By old. that time, it's very unlikely that you become a law. It's not easy to become a law, is it? No. But now I hope and pray that I will, but today I am still just a bill. He signed your bill, now you're a law. Oh, yes! Awesome. Who doesn't love some nostalgia there from some schoolhouse rock, right? So what are the different types of legislation? We've got bills, which are used to propose uh, laws, uh, simple resolutions used to uh, regulate business within a single congressional chamber, joint resolutions, which are used to propose changes in laws and changes in the constitution, and concurrent resolutions, which are used to regulate business within both congressional chambers. These are a little sampling of some different pieces of legislation that Alexandria herself is either co-sponsored or sponsored of each legislative type. So you may have heard of a reconciliation bill before. And that's a special process to advance high priority in fiscal legislation. It's used to change federal taxes, the federal debt limit, and spending programs like SNAP, Medicare, and veteran services. In the Senate, reconciliation bills cannot be filibustered, amendments are limited, and there are significant debate limits. This provides these bills a much better chance of passage. The Byrd rule, named after Robert Byrd, 
blocks extraneous or unrelated provisions that do not change the level of spending revenues. A major reconciliation bill you may have heard of recently, introduced by, jo by Representative John Yarmuth, it provides funding for education, labor, childcare, healthcare, taxes, immigration, and the environment. And uh, these are programs such as the National Forest System, public health infrastructure, homeowner assistance programs, free universal preschool, and expanding Medicare to cover things like hearing. And that sounds like something that would do a lot of good for people, right? Well, as of right now, the Build Back Better Act has been passed in the House, uh, but has yet to be brought up in the Senate. And this is where we see that leadership, the leverage that individual senators have, where this is where it comes into play. Big, important ideas can't progress forward because of things like this. So what are your thoughts about Build Back Better? Love to hear it in the chat. First, I want to share with you some of Alexandria's remarks on Build Back Better. This is from an Ask Me Anything that she hosted on Instagram. Uh, this person asked, knowing that some Democrat senators are dumpster fires, why not piecemeal Build Back Better? We are hurting out here. And I know it's really small, so I made a little bigger for you. The reason we can't build, break up Build Back Better is due to Senate procedure. Because those same Democrats refuse to reform the filibuster, the only meaningful bills we can pass with 51 votes right now are largely limited to reconciliation bills, AKA budget bills. The issue with reconciliation bills is that Senate rules only allow two of those per year. So you can't break them up into tiny pieces and vote on them individually. The first one, for example, was the stimulus checks, the American Rescue Plan. One main electoral way out right now is to elect a Democrat majority that doesn't rely on those dumpster fire Dems. A tall order, I know, but we've made a lot of progress in the House. Right. This wonderful little link here is a handy dandy tool for helping find legislation. This is on congress.gov. And all you do is you can change the parameters right on here and choose what years of Congress you want. You can choose the representatives that you're looking for, or the senators. You can choose by, based off of committees, make them sponsors or co-sponsors, or even browse by, or by legislative action. Right here, I'm just gonna show you some of these legislative actions. So these are all of the different types of actions that legislation can go through. And here we see um, two lines of numbers. The one on the left here is all of the, num the number of all the pieces of legislation that has gone through that action. So whether it's on it right now or did it a while back, they're all in this number here. And this number on the left here, it. Oh, on the right, geez, on the right here uh, is the legislation where this action is its most recent action. Now that we've seen a list of all the actions, what does that really mean and what does that look like? Well, the first step is to introduce the legislation. Only members of the House or Senate may introduce legislation. And then members ask each other to co-sponsor that legislation to show a solid base of support. It's introduced differently in the House and Senate. In the House, bills are uh, dropped right into the hopper, and then they're referred to all of the committees that have jurisdiction over the bill. Each committee can only work on the portion of the bill that's under its jurisdiction, and ultimately one of those committees is gonna be chosen as the primary committee of jurisdiction. In the Senate, bills are submitted to the clerks, and then they're given only to the committee with the most jurisdiction on, over the bill. It's not required for legislation to be referred to committees. However, you're going to notice that it's really commonly done. As a result, committees are pretty inundated with bill referrals, so the chair chooses which legislation they're going to act upon. Ultimately, some bills never get brought up. 
and they get lost in the process. This requires sponsors of the bill to have to be reelected in order to reintroduce the bill later on. Legislation goes through a series of activities if it does go to a committee. They can examine and develop legislation, conduct oversight, and help manage chamber business and activities. Although for the most part, committees mostly um, recommend and disapprove legislation to the full chamber. Most committees also establish subcommittees. One of the main actions that committees take is holding hearings. And this is a public forum where members discuss the strengths and weaknesses of a proposal. They're used to spotlight legislation to colleagues, the public, and the press. Witnesses are then asked to provide written and oral feedback, but these are not required in order for bills to move forward. Markup is the last required at, uh, <laughs> markup is the last required action that is taken in committee. This is where members consider changes by offering an and voting on amendments. Markup concludes when the committee agrees by majority vote to report the bill to chamber. These are some examples of a few different pieces of legislation that Alexandria has sponsored or co-sponsored that are in different places in committee. So these are gonna be Alexandria's committee assignments. First, she's on the Committee on Financial Services, as well as the Subcommittee on National Security, International Development, and Monetary Policy. She's on the Committee on Oversight and Reform, as well as the Subcommittee on Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, and the Subcommittee on Environment. And lastly, she's on the Select Committee on Economic Disparity and Fairness and Growth. Moving on to floor actions. There are many, as you saw, so I've broken them down a little bit. So let's first take a look at the House. The House Rules Committee is a group of representatives who, um, who set the terms for debating and amending a bill by adopting what's called a special rule. The House must choose to debate and choose to adopt the special rule. Special rules generally cover what part of the bill is going to be discussed and limits on the debate and limits on amendments that can be offered on the floor. Once it's adopted, the House considers the bill in a procedural setting called the Committee of the Whole, which we're gonna discuss in just a moment. Before we get too far, I really wanna talk about the suspension of rules. This is the exception to making a special rule. Instead, debate is limited to only 40, min 40 minutes and amendments cannot be offered on the floor. However, this can only be for bills that have a supermajority or two thirds vote in the House, which isn't really common. So let's get back to that committee of the whole. They work closely with majority leadership, currently the Democratic Party, on the main elements of each special rule. This allows members an efficient and efficient way to consider and vote on amendments. Then members vote on each amendment's approval, which requires a simple majority to be agreed to. Amendments must be relevant or germane to legislation being considered. So no fluff added. Afterwards, the Committee of the Whole rises and reports any recommended amendments to the House, which are usually approved. At this point, members may also vote on a motion to reconsider, which allows the minority the minority party, which is currently the Republican Party, to propose its own amendments. On to the Senate floor. First, the Senate must agree to bring up the bill before they can propose any, am any amendments to it. Senate rules doesn't really provide a simple way for a simple majority to impose any debate limits. And as a result, senators are able to wage filibusters to insist on extended debate in order to delay or prevent a final vote. And Senate rules provide very few options to limit, the, uh, limit debate and amendments proposed for a bill, which provides a lot of leverage for each senator. To combat this, the Senate can create unanimous consent agreements. These are used uh, for each bill to debate 
Um, these are used for each bill to debate amendments. They allow the Senate to process business effectively while protecting senators' procedural rights. Resolving differences. Legislation must be fully agreed to by both chambers before it's able to be presented to the president. When a bill is engrossed, or, and when a bill passes in a chamber, it's engrossed or prepared in its official form and sent to the other chamber. Usually the second chamber agrees to the, agrees to the bill, in which case Congress has completed its actions. Sometimes the second chamber decides to amend the first chamber's bill. That chamber has to agree on a proposed alternative and then send that back to the first chamber. Then that chamber has to send their proposed alternative back and so on and so forth. <laughs> Generally, a temporary committee is created called conference committee um, and they use this to negotiate a proposal that can be agreed to by both chambers. Each conference committee is mostly made up of members from the committees that have jurisdiction over the bill. The bill is then prepared in its final official form and presented to the president. Beginning at midnight, the president has 10 days, except Sundays, to sign or veto the bill. If it's signed in that 10 day period, it becomes law. If not, if he vetoes it, then it's returned to the congressional chamber in which it originated. So we've talked a lot about Congress for a while now. So let's talk about Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez and her narrative, platform, and accomplishments. Being elected to the government, um, sorry, uh, Di Alexandria's divergent theory of change. Being elected to the government in a very publicized way with a perceived set of expectations and power that are not necessarily true. The government divided powers to prevent people from abusing them. This includes dividing state and federal powers. Because of this, Alexandria works for the federal government and she cannot control state level issues. Of course, we always want to try, you know, we wish we could do more, but there's a lot of limitations here. Alexandria handles a lot. She's one of only a few progressives, which means that her ideas are frequently blocked by old and outdated values because she doesn't have that solid base of support that Republicans and everyday Democrats really have. Instead of shrugging it off, she chose to engage in community-oriented organizing to get things done in her district. She wasn't gonna let some old white dudes tell her how to lead her minor minority majority district. In doing this, she has brought us through an evolution, a new adaptation of politics and community organizing. Alexandria believes in direct community engagement, where she, her team, and volunteers like you and me knock on doors, stand on corners, make phone calls, talk to businesses, clean up neighborhoods, provide food and supplies to the community, create that connection to constituents, to the people, that is meaningful, real, honest, and important. And she doesn't do this for herself. She does it for her community, the one that she was born in, the one that she lives in. So this is how she bridges that gap. What she cannot do for her community via legislation, she will do via organizing. So I'm curious to hear some of your thoughts on community organizing. So send those into the chat. I want to know how you feel about Alexandria's approach to getting things done in her district. And I'd like you to maybe think back and reflect on the times that you've been really politically motivated and politically engaged. Was it when a certain legislation was passed? Maybe you attended a rally or a protest or was part of a bargaining session for your union? Please share your stories in the chat and we'd love to read some of them. And we're gonna read it in just a moment. While you type, I'm just gonna share some of Alexandria's remarks on progressives in Congress. Here we have another question. Why can't progressives gain control of the party the way the far right took theirs? So I know it's really small, so here it is a little bigger <laughs> again. Progressives in the far right are not two sides of the same coin. 
Special interests and billionaires ally with the far right. Big money does not back progressivism because progressives stand up to dark money and billionaires. Progressives want to raise wages, expand workers' rights, invest, invest in public systems, and tax the very rich. One big way we fight back is make, by making the money matter less, volunteering for campaigns and, and as voters, getting better at critical reading of news campaign material, relying on multiple news sources, and doing our own research with verified, independent, and reliable sources. We are making gains, but it takes more time and energy from everyday people, the little guys, because money doesn't, big money doesn't support us. It is happening though. It just doesn't get written about because that narrative doesn't serve the powerful. And it's important to know here that progressives do not take corporate money. They will not be bought out because their voices are firm. Instead, they take small dollar, dollar donations from everyday people because it's their votes that, they're, that politicians should be trying to win, not billionaires. Making those small dollar contributions to campaigns you care about, even when it's not your district, matter a whole lot. With that donation, we'll not only bring progressive power to Congress, but it also shows these politicians who continue to take dark money that it is possible to be people backed and that the people's voice will be heard. So make those contributions. And if you can't volunteer, and if you can't share the message, keep up the communication and push that narrative because people are power. All right, I'm gonna take a second to look at what some of you guys said. Olivia says, I think cities and suburbs have moved away from community-based living. And I think AOC's way of basing herself and her way of conducting business through community organizing and mobilizing has re-energized how and proven, re-energized how and proven just how powerful communities are. And I totally agree with that. Ali says it feels like it can really work in a place with progressive-ish values, but living in a smallish town in Texas, it feels impo impossible to change my state. And I totally hear you, Ali, and I think it is possible to change your state because I think there's a lot more like-minded people around you than you think there are. And it takes entering into these grassroots organizations and coming together like this to really make your voices heard and prove to everybody that you will have your voice heard. Audrey says, growing up in Idaho, I completely took a hands-off approach to politics because it never aligned with my beliefs. And I didn't know how to break through at that age. 2016 lit a fire under my ass and here I am. I'm all about the people and what helps the majority. And I totally hear that, Aubrey. And thank you so much, everybody, for sharing your thoughts. And please continue to share in the chat. I'm just gonna keep going here, okay? I want to take a minute to share with you some of the issues and policies that motivate Alexandria and provide the, the base of her platform. So Alexandria is fighting for a Green New Deal, Medicare for all, housing as a human right, real public safety, honor and immigration, a just recovery for Puerto Rico, elevating public education, supporting women's and LGBTQIA plus rights, creating a peace economy, justice for workers and small businesses, and aging with dignity. So we've been discussing what Alexandria believes in. So now let's see what the Congressman is doing. First, we're going to take a peek at how progressive legislation moves along. We're going to follow the Combating International Islamophobia Act written by Ilhan, Representative Ilhan Omar and co-sponsored by Alexandria. Let's see what happens. First, the bill is introduced to the House by Representative Ilhan Omar and is referred to the Committee on Foreign Affairs. The committee holds a consideration and markup session. 
And then the committee is ordered to report its amendments and reports them to the floor. Next, a special rule must be made, so it's placed on the union calendar. The House Rule Committee establishes the special rule, which is then adopted and passes the House. The special rule allows for one hour of debate, which is then put to voice vote, where it passes 219 to 212. A motion to reconsider is put on the table, but no one objects. So the bill is sent to the Senate, where it is received, read twice, and referred to its Committee on Foreign Relations. So the process of this legislation began at the end of October 2021, and it's now been over six months <laughs> since uh, it's done, gone anywhere. Um, so this is where we see the terms like killed in committee or died in committee come into play. Uh, we talked about how committees get inundated with referrals. This forces chairs to choose what they're going to work on. And they can never seem to get through it all in a two year period. <laughs> um, so what happens is many of these important bills that hold a lot of meaning for people, they can't even get passed. They can't make it through Congress at all. And these representatives have to be elected over and over again in order to start this process over. So this is part of why we need more progressives in office. <laughs> I wanna show you another bill. This one's called the Taxpayers First Act. And this was written by Representative John Lewis and co-sponsored by Alexandria. And these differ a bit. So first the bill is introduced to the house by Representative John Lewis and it's referred to several committees. Mr. Lewis then moved to suspend the rules and pass the bill and the house agrees. Under suspension of the rules, the house only has 40 minutes to debate during which time it passes. A motion re to reconsider is placed on the table, but no one objects. So the bill is then sent to the Senate, where it's received, read twice, and passes without any amendments. 18 days later, it is presented to the president, and a week after that, it's signed and becomes public law. So we have a pretty good idea here now on about how Congress operates. So how does the progressive politician like Alexandria get things done in her district? I'm gonna let Alexandria speak for herself. This is what she's accomplished in her first term. Hey everyone, so I have been seeing progressive officials around the world do this challenge where we try to squeeze in all of the accomplishments from the last two years in two or three minutes. And since I'm coming to the end of my first term in office, I thought we'd try to do the same. So two years and two-ish minutes. Uh, so let's set the clock, let's try to do it, ready? All right, let's go. This term, we successfully passed legislation to move $5 million to treatment for opioid addiction with funds shifted from the DEA, $10 million in funds to clean up toxic bombardment sites in Vieques, Puerto Rico that were getting people sick. Uh, I repealed the Fair Cloth Amendment in the House, which paves the way for the U.S. to build more public housing for the first time in decades. Passed legislation in the House to ban funds going to the transfer of lethal military equipment to Bolivia. Uh, introduced more amendments than 90% of freshman law makers in the House. I authored and introduced the Green New Deal with Senator Ed Markey and secured 115 House and Senate co-sponsors on it. Regional versions of the Green New Deal were also adopted by 10 local governments, including the state of New Mexico and cities of Austin, Los Angeles, New York City, Boston, and more. We unveiled the Green New Deal for public housing, which would invest up to $180 billion over 10 years and create up to a quarter million jobs per year nationwide. I authored the Just Society suite of bills, which would modernize the federal poverty standard, make immigrants eligible for social safety programs, require federal contractors to pay 15 bucks an hour, strengthen tenant protections, and ease reentry for formerly incarcerated citizens. I introduced the Loan Shark Prevention Act with Senator Sanders to credit uh, to cap credit card interest rates at 15%. I called for the bailout for taxi cab drivers targeted in predatory lending schemes and sought over, uh, tougher <coughs> oversight in New York City taxi medallion lending. We introduced the COVID-19 Funeral Assistance Act which would help families get up to 10K in 
funeral expenses, who lost loved ones during the pandemic. I co-sponsored 78 pieces of legislation that passed the House, 14 that were signed into law, and that's before we get to our investigations. During committee hearings, my question lines helped pressure Big Pharma into bringing down the price, the price of PrEP to prevent HIV transmission, exposed Transdime, a defense contractor, into returning $16.1 million in price gouge profits to the public, pressured Facebook to fact-check political ad um, fact-checking political advertising and exposed Mark Zuckerberg's dinner parties with radical right-wing figures. We got President Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, to state on the record that uh, President Trump was engaging in tax fraud and to name other potential witnesses. We overturned the unjust citizenship question on the census. We stopped the deportation of whistleblowers from the Irwin County Detention Center and traveled to the border to expose abuse of immigrant families in detention and the inhumanity of child separation. I was nominated twice in the Democracy Awards, which was the first time a member of Congress was recognized in two categories, at home in the Bronx and Queens. We helped over a thousand constituents with VA, Social Security, immigration visas, and other federal services, attended over 600 events in the district, hosted 25 town halls, and when our community became the epicenter of the epicenter, we mobilized a full COVID response operation, including 200,000 community check-in calls, 80,000 meals to families in need, 100 thousand masks to teachers, small businesses, and essential workers. We organized and launched a homework helpers program and recruited over 11,000 tutors to offer one-on-one -on -one help for kids in remote learning, uh, raised 1.25 million for local organizations doing COVID relief, hosted eight training sessions to teach over 10,000 people how to unionize their workplace, form mutual aid networks, and child care collectives during COVID and more. We launched a multilingual outreach effort on the census, which brought in over $58 million to our district. On the presidential campaign, I co-chaired the Climate Unity Task Force with Secretary Kerry to help shape President-elect Biden's $2 trillion climate policy. We raised nearly $600,000 for grassroots organizations in uh, Georgia and more than $1.5 million for progressives and swing district Democrats across the country. In my own race, I fended off over $10 million dollars in corporate back to tax without taking a single cent from lobbyists, fossil fuel executives, or corporate money. We won, and I was honored to win re-election with nearly 72% of the vote in the highest turnout election that New York 14 has ever seen. Whew, okay, that's not everything we accomplished, but it's still a pretty good list. I ran over and it would not have been, but none of this would have been possible without you all, um, your support, small dollar donations, uh, your organizing. These accomplishments are not mine, they're all of ours. And so I thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Alex. All right. So you may have noticed that the majority of her accomplishments come from her campaign team and the work they were able to do by organizing directly within the community. And it was not from her legislative accomplishments as much. Uh, and that's, again, due to the amount of pushback that exists in the government today. Uh, so what do you think about that? And do you think it's effective? We know that Alexandria does things a little differently. She is shifting the paradigm, and as my professor would say, by changing the way we view elected officials and our personal roles as enactors of change in our communities. So where do we fit into the equation? And how can we be informed, engaged, and represented? Being informed is vital because if you don't know what's happening to you and around you, then you'll be limited in your ability to take necessary steps to change it. So first you should learn about your Congress members. Right? <laughs> learn who represents your district in the House of Representatives and the Senate. So I got some links here. And I know it's a lot of information to have to go across three different websites, but I do truly recommend that you look at all three. <laughs> Um, so right on this one here, you go to congress.com slash members slash find your members. And all you do is you type in your zip code, say maybe you live in Detroit. And these would be your representatives right here. Once it decides to load. And these are your senators and your representative. And you can select one of them. We'll choose Rashida here. And here you can get connected to their house website, you can get their contact information, you can even see a nice little picture of their district. 
But what's really important is when you scroll down, you get to this wonderful section where you see all of their sponsored and co-sponsored legislation. Then on the biographies here, this has biographies of, of representatives, as well as um, all the Congresses that they've served on and any books that they've been a part of. So this is Nancy Pelosi's biography. It's got a nice big one. It's been on a number of Congresses here and she has a pretty extensive bibliography. And here on the clerk website, you can get their contact information, their website, as well as their committee assignments, which is cool, and all their recent floor votes. So you can see everything that your representatives have voted on. All right. Also, you should keep updated on legislation. So this is that same link that we've used before to find legislation. But what's cool about this one for the floor summary is that you can actually also watch them live. So it has today's floor summary going on. We can also click on this calendar and you can go back in time and see what's happened on the floor on any date in the past. And through this, you can probably find some interesting trends. This doesn't stop at the federal level. Uh, staying informed on the state level is also just impor as important. Right here, you can use this little link to get to any state legislature web website that you'd like. Got a nice little map here. Just choose on the state you want and it'll take you right to the website. Before we move on, I just wanna note that the government obscures some of its information by using older terminology big words, and what I like to call legalese or lawyers speak. They put the information out there purposely hard to read on purpose. <laughs> um, and this is part of how people in power are able to gatekeep certain groups from progressing and taking charge of their futures. They don't want, they want you silenced. They want me silenced. They want Alexandria silenced. And so this is why engagement is one of the most necessary tools to make a difference in your community today, because power is truly in the hands of the people. And one of the easiest things you can do is continue to learn and continue to share that knowledge. So the first step is to simply show up, just like you're doing right now. Find a cause that you support and join an organization, unionize, attend rallies, protests, trainings, table talks, community events, town halls. Showing up is the first step to getting your ideas across to your representatives, as well as meeting politically engaged and like-minded people. This right here is Alexandria's platform in the event that you were interested in seeing the kinds of issues that she is motivated by. You get some more information right on there and the worker power toolkit here. And this is a wonderful little guide to organizing your workplace. It's got some printouts right here and a nice little video and it'll help you unionize your own workplace, mutual aid. You may have heard of this before. It's a practice in politics that emphasizes solidarity, recognizing that our well-being, health, dignity, and our survival depends on cooperation within the network of community. It's really the basis of what we do here. Um, we do it every day. It's connecting with others that are within your network and finding that space to make that change happen. These are some of Alexandria's remarks on getting engaged. This person asked, I live in a red state slash county, but I wanna make a difference. Where do I start? And her response is really for everybody. But she says, organize and unionize your workplace, join grassroots organizations, engage in housing and tenant organizing, run for local down ballot seats, attend and run teach-ins, and all of these other things that we've been talking about and we'll continue to talk about today. One of the th biggest ways you can be engaged in your community is to volunteer for events where you meet those like-minded people while supporting the community still. 
Here at Team AOC, we have a wide variety of events that you can attend. We've got deep canvassing. This is where we have real meaningful conversations with voters about Alexandria, her campaign, her wins in Congress, and her plans for the future. And we do these in person as well as online. This is that link to volunteer. In-person events. We also lead community events in our district. We clean up neighborhoods, we work with organizations, NYCHA residents, religious affiliates, and more. And if you're not into going to things in person, or maybe you live in a different state or country, that's not a problem because we have a variety of virtual events like this one right here, phone banks, texting, data entry, and lots more. So lobbying is a really direct approach to influencing your government officials. Lobbying doesn't mean you have to be a lobbyist. There are actually a lot of rules regarding that, but uh, these are a few things that anyone can do. So you could write to your representatives, send them a well-worded letter about the policies and issues that matter most to you in your community. And uh, there's that find your member link again. Call your representatives. These are the House and Senate federal switchboards here. You can call them anytime and say that same thing that you wrote in the letter. <laughs> or you could even lobby your representatives in person. Uh, you can do this on your own with a group, with friends, or with an organization that will load some constituents onto a bus and take them straight to the source. <laughs> uh, this right here is Alexandria's platform again, but I'm going to show you this little lobby toolkit that was created by the Physicians for a National Health Program. And it's really awesome because it kind of breaks down what the process for having that congressional visit, that lobbying visit is, about setting it up, meeting with them, how to prepare, and all this stuff. It's a very good little toolkit there. There's a lot that goes into lobbying in person, and some of the main takeaways would be to be clear and concise. Keep your information short and to the point. <laughs> um, ask specific questions, provide written materials that you can leave them with, and always follow up. And now for the most important action you can possibly take, voting. <laughs> right? uh, vote for candidates that accurate, accurately represent you. So first you gotta be registered. <laughs> Register online, by mail or in person. And you can request that ballot over the phone at 1-800-4-VOTE or 1-800-367-8683. You can go to ocasiocortez.com slash vote. And this will get you some information really mostly about New York State here, but it's got quite a uh, wealth of knowledge for you. Or go to vote.org. If you don't live in New York, <laughs> get information for every state right on here. Absentee and early ballots. Um, you can request to, um, if you plan on voting absentee or early, request your ballots now and double check that you're polling place because sometimes if you want to vote early, that early voting place is not the same as your normal polling place. So take that time today to double check. And here's your cherry on top of your hot fudge Sunday of organizing supporting progressive candidates. The, I know we've talked about this, but the main reason Alexandria herself cannot accomplish enough for her community via legislation as a legislator is because she stands with a very small squad. And it's up to us to make that squad bigger, <laughs> right? And we can't block outdated politics unless we have new politicians coming in. So Alexandria really believes heavily in uplifting and supporting other candidates. It's one of Alexandria's core beliefs. And one way she accomplishes that was by creating the Courage to Change Political Action Committee. And I'm gonna let her talk about this for a brief minute. These are our Courage to Change candidates. 
60 candidates across New York City. We put together, along with policy experts, grassroots leaders, advocates, the standards that need to be met and the commitments that need to be met on a policy level for our next city council. There's 27 different commitments ranging in everything from schooling to housing to public safety to climate. And what we found were 60 city council candidates willing to make that pledge on all 27 points. We are coming together as a movement because that's what ranked choice voting will allow us to do. If you are a voter in New York City, check out the Courage to Change voting guide. It is highly likely that a Courage to Change candidate is in your neighborhood. Awesome. So recently, Alexandria was actually able to expand the Courage to Change pack to include national candidates who took the pledge as well. So their website is actually a really great resource for finding those candidates. And you can see that she has um, endorsed people from across many states here. Alexandria also frequently endorses candidates. For her, endorsements mean more than just words on paper. It comes with action. Her team mobilizes to support these progressive races and help them get elected. Finally, I want to share with you some of Alexandria's remarks on supporting candidates. This is from her Instagram story. People often want the names of people to go after for bad decisions. That's important information and accountability is key. It's one big reason we have journalists, activism and more. But I also find that people less frequently want the names of the helpers, the people who made brave decisions despite so much pressure to do the opposite. We need those people and good decisions to celebrate too. I see that brave, honest, progressive leaders are growing in strength and numbers on a level that we haven't seen in a very, very long time. There are so many people whose courage goes unrecognized. And when we don't celebrate doing the right thing, then it adds to pressure for buckling for the wrong thing. And this is a final message from Alexandria herself. Number one, be supportive of them very publicly and their positions very early and continue to do that because leaders are less likely to mess with people who are being watched and it encourages them to stay strong. And we really want these progressive candidates to stay strong. So I now want to encourage you to take the next 10 minutes with us and we're going to just do a couple of simple tasks. First, I want you to just take a couple minutes to look up your representatives and see what legislation they support. Just put in your zip code. Throw us in the Bronx here. And here you'll find your legislators. Click on the legislator that you're looking for. Go ahead and scroll on down to the bottom here. And here you're gonna see all this information about those bills that they've sponsored or co-sponsored. What I want you to do is click on the 116th and 117th Congresses. We wanna get the last four years. And I want you to change the status of legislation to became law. And I want you to take a look through that list that you're gonna see there. It's gonna be a shorter list than any other one that you'll see. Um, and uh, I would love for you to choose one that you think is pretty interesting and go ahead and copy the, I would like for you to get that designation if you can in the um, title of the bill and go ahead and copy and paste that right into the chat. And we can all just, uh, so we can all see what kind of interesting legislation <laughs> all of these people are passing, right? All right, then when you're done with that, I'd really love for you to check your voter registration. <laughs> please, please, please check your voter registration. If you're 
thinking about um, voting early, voting absentee, uh, please request that absentee ballot now, double check on your polling place, make sure that your registration is active and correct. Take that time right now so that it's all ready and good to go when the elections happen. And the last thing I want you to do is I really wanna see you all again. <laughs> we continue to come up with new and interesting events, both in person and online. And we want you to be a part of this really important shift in our lives. So I'm gonna leave this up for a minute. Real quick, I'm gonna go over that document that I just posted in the chat for you. It's a four page document and it's all that information that I just went over right at the end there. It's got all of those links that we've been talking about. It's got a nice little description on everything that you can do to make sure that you're engaged, represented and informed in government. And I also have this nice little worksheet at the end. There you can put in all the information about your representatives so you can have it in one place <laughs> and a little space for you to put your organizing mission, thinking about what motivates you, what you'd like to see changed and how you can be a part of that change. So all these links are on there for you. They're all hot, so you should be able to use them to get to all of um, these wonderful resources that I was talking about today. I wanna thank you all so much for coming and I really appreciate you all taking the time out of your day to come in here and organize with us. I really hope you all had a wonderful time. I know I did.